And uh, oh, hey, it's being live streamed. Look at that. So on, so on. Hey, look at that. Welcome, everybody. It's an e conference in 2022 because why the hell not? And uh, really excited to have all of you uh, joining us this afternoon. Of course, the reason we're having any conference at all uh, is because it was Cat Hunt and Callie Boyle uh, from Ingram Planetarium down in North Carolina, Sunset Beach, beautiful Sunset Beach. And I was like, hey, you want to talk about escape rooms in the planetarium? And then that ended up becoming the, you know, we should do an e-conference. And then that became commit to the bit. Now we're here. It is April 15th and we're going to have a fantastic time. So we have a full schedule today. Um, Callie will be uh, our, our host for the first part talking about planetarium escape rooms. We have an update. I think we're at update 88 from uh, noted North Carolina planetarium man, Ken Brandt. So everybody get excited for that. Um, I'm going to give you an IPS update because again, why not? Uh, and then an update uh, about uh, our uh, our Chilean ambassadors in 22 and 23. Uh, I think it's going to be Shannon, although Tiffany's in the room, so it would be, I guess, Shannon and Tiffany in some way, shape, or form. And then uh, the important part is the how you doing segment, which is literally just, hey, how's everybody doing? And do you want to talk about stuff? Uh, and then, of course, we have our, our, our great recurring segments, Mike Smale with the record shop, on a green with long German words of the week. And of course, we're going to end today with um, call it your best parts of the of the first quarter of the year. Um, what's been good for you? And, and uh, uh, what are you looking forward to in the, the days, weeks and months to come? So to stay exactly on time, uh, I am uh, really, really happy to turn over to Callie Boyle, who is the new planetarium manager, director, coordinator, uh, manager. We'll the new the planetary time. manager of the Ingram Planetarium at in Sunset Beach, uh, and of course taking over for Cat Hunt. Um, Cat, congratulations on your new role. So again, that's probably a best part. But uh, Callie, please take it away. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me here. I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, we've been doing a lot with uh, putting on what we call adventure games or escape rooms within the planetarium. And specifically what we're trying to do is build a highly immersive hands-on experience. And it also covers a lot of uh, STEM uh, subjects as well. So I'm gonna share my screen. We have some presentation things to share here. All right. So can everyone hear and see okay? Just a quick thumbs up, sounding good, excellent. All right. So on the basis of creating an immersive experience, what we have done so far in our planetarium is all built on the foundation of a NISE network kit that we had ordered. Um, so the NISE network kit is a moon adventure game. So it is set with this idea and storyline that you are in the future on a base that has been set up on the moon to progress further space exploration. Uh, it ties in with a lot of things like recently they've discovered that there is water ice on the moon. So what kind of potential could that lead to? Their kit that they send with this is pretty impressive. It comes with a lot of things that are laid out here. You get signs that uh, explain and break down each challenge that a visitor would go through. Uh, when we first presented this as our moon adventure game, it was best suited to have smaller family groups come through. So you would have groups of about four to eight or so, and that was generally a good crowd to have. So we would rotate multiple groups through um, in a day, resetting our kits here. So in total, the kit comes with different challenges and all kinds of things. Here I have an example of a video 
of one of our challenges. They set up their own electrolysis kits to create oxygen. Um, there's a little bit of audio, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this here. Hopefully that comes through okay. So yeah, they have a accident in the game where they are losing access to their oxygen. So they have to learn about electrolysis and the process of breaking down that important water element that is featured throughout the game here. So a breakdown of the challenges are first, they're working with a rover. And this is where the escape room element really starts to come in because they are working with maps and map locations to solve codes that they are getting from their rover. So then they receive data back from the rover that they then have to match up with puzzles on maps. Um, as they are doing this, one of the foundations of moving the story forward is that there is a quake that happens. So with the quake happening, you lose access to your oxygen tanks and the power goes out. So one of their responsibilities is extracting water, filling the oxygen tank through electrolysis and then reconnecting the power supply. So where we pushed forward was making it really immersive by adding in elements such as you guys can see here. We've got a nice background with a dome overlay on top of it, really making you feel like you are set up on the moon and engaging you into that experience as well. So some of our different things that we use to add extra elements were backgrounds, lighting, and then sound effects. Of course, we got to shout out Chroma Cove for the lighting coding that we had also featured in that picture. Um, we were able to use themes that really enhanced and um, just made it a lot more fun in the dome. And of course, we used some additional sound effects as well, and they all came from an open source. So we have a sound effect of rumbling for our quake, as well as emergency alarms and systems resetting, just that kind of thing. So here we had a group going through. You can see we have our red lighting turned up. Um, basically, we used Starry Night and then ATM4 coding to program our background and lighting together. And that was really how we built up that extra layer there. But here we have our group. Our kit came with an awesome water extractor you can see on the table here. Basically, you put in ice blocks. There's a counterweight system that will drop out water for you. That's how you get your water from your water ice. And the kit that came with the NISE Network was very builder friendly. It came with a lot of easy instructions and uh, it lasted for uh, an entire couple months of doing the game, probably a few times each week. So also very sturdy, the things that came with the kit as well. So what we expanded upon was after we had completed doing them as lunar missions and we had collected some data that we were sending back to NISE Network for that, we took it on our own and decided to build upon the foundation to add in an extra bit of flair to make it a mission to Mars. So Mars, especially right now, we have a limited time, uh, Mars 1001 running, and a lot of people are very excited about feeling like they are immersed in all these things that they're hearing about, um, especially when it comes to some of the more popular things in social media and such with sciences right now. So here's just another example of sound clip layered with lighting to really give an effect here. This is when they have received a message from their rover saying that they are potentially going to be in danger. Thank you. 
So we took an entire shift from having our orange kind of ambient lighting for our Mars background to the red flashing alarm system. And once that earthquake is over, we have shifted into our next narrative, which is now your power has gone out. Our red lighting is up so that they can see um, a little bit more for some of the potential challenges that they're taking on. And um, it fades up and stays there um, intentionally for them being able to see and move around. One challenge that we actually did have in the dome was sometimes things would be a little too dark. We would have to include the addition of flashlights for people to be able to really be able to move around in there safely. And I have one more uh, video here. So uh, the last challenge is that they have to reconnect a power supply. You basically build a small circuit board that leaves two metal pieces that they have to figure out what is uh, conductive and able to connect their circuit board. So once they reconnect their circuit board, uh, they have a reboot. Still better than the old dial-up tones from the 90s, rebooting back on there to the system. And as we shifted it over to our Mars game, we really had in mind um, having it facilitated to a larger audience. So by changing up just a few of the challenges, we were able to have two groups that were working independently, yet they would end up and realize that they would come together in the time of emergencies. So that was also something that we really pushed was teamwork and effort uh, where you join together to be able to solve the puzzles in the game. So of course, for the NISE Network uh, kit, if you guys are interested, you can go to nisenet.org. There's their moon game is what they call it, their moon adventure game. And if you guys would like to see any of our setup or particular things that we posted in regards to advertising, you can check out our information as well for Ingram Planetarium. So that's it on the presentation side. I guess we have some time that went pretty quick there. So if anybody has any particular questions about any immersive stuff here, I guess I will go ahead and open up for that. Okay, Ken, you have your hand raised. Yes, Callie, first off, congratulations on your new posting. And you as well, Kat, of course. Um, but, you know, well done. Now, wear Thank your you. captain's wings proudly. <laughs> um, so the question is this. Um, specific to, I guess, uh, correlating with school standards, because I'm guessing most of your visitors during the day are school groups? Or We are actually um, majority uh, public planetarium. We get a lot of tourists coming in from the area. We do have school groups during the day, but they mostly go for our show and star show experience. Um, this is something we've only done with the public, but okay. maybe interested in reaching out to schools to see the potential there. Sure, maybe figuring out uh, what standards it might be aligned with and stuff and what grade levels would be. Um, it, something like this would be very useful because I'm always looking for new tricks to how to do more interaction in, under the dome. And so I'm, I'm curious, very curious about this and how you guys actually, the mechanics of setting it up and stuff. Kelly, Thank question from the chat uh, from Ian. How many students, or I guess in this case, audience members, um, do you have at one time for one of these programs? 
when we had just the basic moon adventure game, it was best suited for groups of about, I would say anywhere from about five to eight was when everybody could successfully be able to take part in all the activities together. Um, in order to cater to a larger audience, we actually ended up re building some of the things that were inspired by the kit so that basically we could set it up for a team versus team type thing and have about five to 10 each way. So we could have up to 20 people and still have everyone be able to be active. All right, more chat questions from Thaddeus. Uh, what age ranges have you found it works best for? In one portion of it, I actually had split up our team and I had um, a lot of people who were a little bit on the older side. They might have been late middle school, high school, and then we had some elementary kids. So I sent the elementary kids more to the things that involved the circuit board while I had the older audience do the electrolysis system. So if you have specific needs you're trying to meet like that, you can cater it as well. Most groups would come in as family, but the kit also comes with an early um, childhood education adaptation uh, version as well. Now we didn't do that. Most of our visitors, I would say, were probably above about eight years of age. So I would say that's the age range you wanna to go to. I wouldn't really go much lower than eight years old for the full scale version here. And then uh, looks like our last question here would be um, sort of demand, how is demand? And then sort of how is it ticketed for these events? When we were first using the NIAS network uh, thing, it was a free experience that we offered because it was for data collection. And so we would go and have people reserve, but since it was a time thing, it did take about 20 to 30 minutes per group, depending about on how fast they could get through it. Um, but we would usually go through four groups of people and we were doing it as the moon game. So that would give us about 30 or so spots that we could really get away with. Whenever we do it as the Mars game, we only offer it at 20 seats. We do it one, one day a week so far, and we had all 20 slots taken when we did it on our Sunday afternoon, so. And then given that, how do you think you could uh, adapt that as a challenge, like specifically for an adult crowd? Uh, or is there anything that you would change in that? I think that it also works and entertains well for adult audiences too, because it has that puzzle element. Um, and some of the things that we changed around for our Mars game as well, we um, created our own maps and things that are based on locations in Mars. And we have, there are also worksheets and items that available that come with the kit that are on different levels as well. So you can definitely do a little bit of mixing and matching with the challenges to either make them a little tougher or in some cases a little easier. There was one particular challenge people struggled with that we changed around in our Mars game that had a little bit more success. They had to match things on a map and the map just wasn't very clear um, to some guests. So that was some things we were able to change. Any other questions for Kelly and escape rooms? Awesome. Well, Kelly, thank you so much again. Congratulations. And uh, your inaugural e-conference presentation, wonderfully received. Thank you very much for having me, guys. And so now sticking with the Carolina theme, um, you know him, you love him, North Carolina planetarium man, Ken Brandt. Hi. Hi, everybody. Aw, you guys are cool. Um, so this is a very happy story that we're going to be sharing. I'm going to be sharing with you today. And I can't figure out where the hell my PowerPoint went. Wow. How? Mm, okay. So let me stop this for a second. You would think that we'd already worked out the bugs of this by now, right? Oh, whoops. I did it twice. That's dumb. 
don't, I don't want that one. Okay, sorry guys. Wow, there it is. Okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> okay, um, can you guys see my screen here? I'm going to make it full screen here in a minute. And quick, name that astronaut. It's Dan Brandt. Is nope, it not Dave Brandt. Scott? That is Dave Scott. Who said that? Your, your humble host. Nice. Well, nicely struck, Michael. That is correct. Because we're in that window of time that's the 50th anniversary for Apollo 16. And, of course, you know what's going to happen here. He's going to drop the feathers. I always... Whenever we talk about the moon, I always show this clip for a couple of really good reasons. A, believe it or not, most of your students don't think the moon has gravity. Okay, I found that this is a, a very anecdotal study, but you know, of all the students I've seen, about twenty percent know the moon has some gravity. You know, and then of course you show them this, it's like, uh, how'd that happen? <laughs> you know, so one kid went so far as to say it was uh, magnetic boots on the astronauts, but. Of course, that isn't what we're doing. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. Hopefully, they'll hit the ground at the same time. Now, of course, I always pause it right before then and ask that question. Which, well, gonna, which is going to hit first? Then they got four choices. They got the hammer, the feather, uh, none of them because there's no gravity, or they both land at the same time. And, of course, only about 5% of the kids will get that one. Um, if they've had forces in motion, like in high school... That number jumps up to about 10%. <laughs> okay, now, right after, you guys have seen the slides of the planetarium underwater and all that other happy crap. I'm not doing that again. Okay, I don't want to look at that picture anymore. All right. Um, this is a graph, and it just didn't transfer into PowerPoint very well. Uh, the orange line at the very top, you're just seeing the nub of. That is the uh, English and math uh, average scores for students in Robinson County. Uh, the bottom line, which is 15 points bigger than the orange one, is the science scores for our county. Now, we're not any different from any any um, other of the other rural counties we're surrounded by, with one exception. We have a planetarium and a science center. And before it flooded, these are the test results from the last year before it went under. Um, the point I was making, and I, I, made, I started making this point, in the end of October, as soon as we start meeting, started meeting again once the water had gone away. Um, that, I presented this to the November school board meeting that year. And this uh, simply shows a, a chart. And who else can lay claim to that, that bounteous uh, uh, boost in points there? I went ahead and took credit for it. And I had the eight-page bibliography uh, because it was in a graduate class working on the efficacy of the planetarium. I compiled an eight-pager um, from all different sources from the last 70 years uh, talking about the, the value of a planetarium and why it's important to have one as a, as a kid gets exposed to knowledge. And this graph really, you know, honestly, if you pick it apart statistically, it, it has no, it washes right out. I get it. But none of them would think to ask that question, so that's cool. <laughs> uh, this is our current setup right now. We're in an elementary school cafeteria, or what used to be one. You can see the uh, dome inflated there in the background. And that's a six meter dome. And right now that holds like 25 kids and adults, uh, if you space them out right. And in the front, some of you recognize that as being the software from um, Salt Lake City's Clark Planetarium. Um, this is awesome stuff right here. This uh, whole creating a black hole, which is what you see in the middle of the screen there. Six different kids can interact with this thing. If you haven't seen it at a hospitality suite near you, um, I don't know if they're going to maps, but you know, if they bring this thing, check it out. Pretty fun. All right, so what do we do once the flood happens? Uh, four months after the flood, no, two months after the flood, the superintendent's cabinet approves uh, deployment of the inflatable planetarium that I went out and bought basically at the end of October of that year. Um, we were approved to uh, demonstrate it at the Robinson County Partnership for Children Pro Bono. Now, the room they had me in was about four feet longer than the planetarium. So it was perfectly suited for putting a planetarium in and having kids come in and go out. Nothing else. I couldn't even set up a display table uh, that would work very well. And um, the pro bono thing, we're going to talk about that again. Um, we got this room 
to use for almost three school years for $125 a day. We didn't pay any of that. The broom cost $125, $125 to rent for a day normally. Uh, we got it for free. So the Partnership for Children literally gave us tens of thousands of dollars of in-kind donations. Um, so when people ask for matching fund grants, it's easier when you can say, well, yeah, we got this, you know, 40000 we never paid these people. Uh, likewise, the 40000 for the architect. You know, Tim Berry, most of you know him. He has been working on the Robinson Planetarium project since uh, October 2017 when I talked about it at the Pleiades Conference in St. Louis. And so I'm really grateful that uh, I made that announcement at lunchtime and he just pulled me over and said, hey, I'm going to work with you. And, um, he, and free. So we've gotten much in the way of free stuff from people, you know, NASA, of course, the usuals, um, and all that. You can see the timeline here. Uh, Bill MacArthur is the local astronaut. And, of course, Charles Graham and Danny Britt, you're going to see their names again. Um, they are the instrumental guys who kept our planetarium building in the budget through numerous very nasty negotiations at the state level. Um, you know, I mean, very simple scenario, Republican legislature, Democratic governor, <laughs> and go, all right? So these are some letters of support. Alan Gould actually turned uh, the idea of the letter of support into a template. If you go to the website for IPS and you look for support, um, letters of support, you actually see a blank template with all the, all the particulars blanked out so you can just fill in. I am in full support of the rebuild of the blank planetarium and science center or planetarium because, and it goes through a whole bunch of blanks. It's very cool. So I'm very proud that we are the ones who instigated that, um, that letter of support template. Now we can see a lot of different, um, these are two vendors that send in really nice letters um, or consultants. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill, another thing that's developed over the last five years, we're in partnership with them now. They're they're going to develop content for us using their video um, video um, production lab and also um, I'm working with get with them to get a marketing intern to help me market this stuff because what we got is good the problem is I have no idea how to do marketing and publicity and yes Michael I need to review that launch pad thing you guys did about six months ago with uh, how to market a new show um, I need to run run through that again because that was very helpful Okay, so there's this is a packet that an architectural firm put together called SFLA uh, put together to show, you know, to show to lobby for the state legislature. So they did the real grunt work of lobbying. They produced this. They gave it to the people during spring break last year. I was on the phone with all these superintendents, getting quotes and letters of support from them. And um, these are all the superintendents in the counties near us, except for of course Cumberland, which which has the Fayetteville State University Planetarium, so I didn't pester them. <laughs> um, and one of the superintendents went out, of the way, went out of his way and wrote this beautiful letter. I didn't ask him for a letter. He just wrote it, and he sent it to Danny and to um, Charles Graham. Our local astronaut, Bill MacArthur, um, wrote a beautiful letter, which is partially visible here, um, supporting the rebuild of the planetarium. That was a very nice one. Um, now, this happened Tuesday night. And I want to take you to, I'm going to stop sharing this screen for a minute. Um, but you can see the goodies there. That was the image I posted up on uh, Facebook earlier today. And why am I not be able to stop sharing? Okay, I'm not seeing my cursor, guys. All right, let's do student body left here and see what happens. All right. Okay. All right, there we go. Nope, there it is. All right, so I zapped out of the slide. That's what was going on there. So I'm going to share a different screen. And that screen is going to show you a clip from a school board meeting. Can everybody see the the information, the agenda on the board there? Michael, can you see that okay? It's clear. Very good. Okay. Are you hearing that? It's chair members, what we want to do is get a picture of the full board and can as um, the representatives. There. Yes. So and there's Representative Graham Senator right behind Britt me there. Senator Britt Graham to present the chair is right over uh, Graham's head over here. And that guy calling me Ken is my superintendent. 
So. Yeah, Brenda, get on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> He's short. <laughs> Just let us on up here. So, so much for social distancing. So far, I'm COVID negative. <laughs> but we'll wait and see what happens there. But there we are, all are uh, holding the check I just showed you. Uh, and of course, the camera's back here. None of us knew that at the time. So one of the, the reasons I show this is because the support I've gotten from these people is nothing short of fantastic. Um, you know, my superintendent calls me Ken. What else do you need to know? All right. Um, the community, we got a, a very nice advisory board that's working with us to help the fine tuning now. Now that we've got the seed money for the planetarium, next step, of course, is the equipment that's going to go in it and the exhibits that are going to be displayed there. One of the cool things is, I'm going to share my screen one more time, the current design looks like this. This is uh, the design that was submitted to the state for the rest of the funding to build the school. And you'll see in the lower right hand corner here, that's the planetarium. And this is the second floor of the building. And so you can see the dome poking up into the second floor and the science center also um, going up to the second floor. So we have all kinds of opportunities for banger, banner hanging <laughs> and other cool stuff. All right, so here's what's going to happen in the next three months. By the end of April, the State Board of Instruction, Public Instruction is going to make a ruling on the funding for this, this high school. Now, we applied for funding for this about four years ago and were turned down. And the, the way the law is written for these extra funds because of COVID was, you know, if you had a, an application before and it's still sound and you're ready to break ground with this thing, um, you can apply for up to $40 million or more funding. And that application went in about a month ago. It's supposed to be um, approved at the April State School Board meeting. Um, we're pretty much shooed in because we're grandfathered in by the clause in the law. Um, the second thing to notice about this is off to the right and in the corner of the school. So I'm going to have my own bus loop or part front part of the bus loop when the bus loop gets drawn in front of the building here. Um, so the kids can go straight into the planetarium. I lobbied really hard for that one because the last thing I wanted to do was have fourth graders mingling with high school kids. And the other thing about this, this is going to be a technical technology high school. And there's all kinds of metal shops and metalworking things that are going to be happening here. Woodworking and things that you might expect would be happening in a, um, in a technical high school. And wouldn't it be cool? Remember the Exploratorium and their cookbook? with exhibits that you can actually build wouldn't it be cool if there's an exhibit in the science center that was built by the kids over here in the uh, welding room right and you could just say yeah it was done in classroom 3c down there um and there's a little plaque on the thing of course so when fourth graders see it we're kind of marketing for the high school and the high school is building some of our exhibits breaking bringing down the cost so that's a pretty decent thing the other cool thing that's happening by july um, we put an application in for reimbursement from FEMA for all the things we lost. And we used the school district in this case. Um, and the total came up to about $88 million. We submitted that back in 2017. And FEMA said in 2018, yeah, we'll give you 4.5. Uh, no. And so nobody really knew what to do with this at this point. Um, it just kind of lay dead in the water for two years. And then our current superintendent said, uh, why don't we challenge this? So he got in touch with the DC law firm and the law firm is, um, you know, is headed by the guy who used to run FEMA for, I think the Bush administration and, um, the second Bush, the uh, Bush, the younger his administration. And so this means that, um, by the end of July, we put the appeal in back in November. And then um, FEMA, or October, excuse me, last year, FEMA had 180 days to respond, ask questions, delay the process, in other words, and they failed to do that. And so now the school board also Tuesday night approved the arbitration, where our D.C. law firm that we paid a couple hundred thousand uh, to retain is going to wage this battle with the current FEMA. I anticipate a 50-50 split, which means another $52 million, if, I, if I'm doing my math right. Anyway, it's really, really a good thing. And this is probably going to make for one hell of a July 4th weekend. 
because that's when the decision has to be done by 90 days. So, um, you know, I was joking with the auditor, the guy running all this for the district, and said, man, we are going to have a great 4th of July party, aren't we? And he goes, I think so. <laughs> and he, he's very soft-spoken and underspoken. He doesn't say much. So, um, so that was a really good thing to hear. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, and I'll just leave it with this. You know I'm going to be asking you for help. And the part I didn't show you in the clip here, um, Danny Britt says uh, to uh, the school board, you know, that was the senator guy. He says, I was only in office a couple of weeks back in 2016 before I get this phone call from this Ken Brandt guy. Who is this guy? And my former boss, who's now a school board member, looked at him very dryly and said, he is persistent. Man, I want that on my tombstone. <laughs> he was persistent, you know. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to questions or comments or whatever you guys want to do. Thank you. Ken, I think we're just speechless that it's happening. <laughs> very, very happy for you. Yeah, man. Yep, so you vendors get up and get in line. <laughs> So, because we're going to go shopping <laughs> pretty soon. I'm actually looking forward to the shopping trips, you know. We do have a question um, okay. from the uh, from uh, from Kyle, Kyle Doan. Um, do you have the ability to set up an endowment with any additional funds to help maintain the planetarium into the future? That's a really good idea. Um, right now, we really haven't done any fundraising yet. That my advisory board hasn't really gotten in too into that yet. Um, I'm trying to ease them gently into that portion of our, our of our journey here because now, you know, we're going to get a set amount from the school board to build the planetarium, and that five million will probably put up the walls of the place. And whoops, sorry, I got a spam call. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, so Kyle, that's a really good idea, and definitely, um, you know, I'll pick your brain some more about that one. I'm also going to talk to Todd Boyette at Moorhead because he runs a major fundraising board up there. Um, and um, he, they will certainly be able to help, at least providing advice. I don't think they're going to contribute to what we're doing down in Lumberton from Chapel Hill, but they will be able to provide some advice and counsel, you know. And, um, you know, and Todd's pretty good people. I've gotten to know him pretty well over the last five years, and he's a nice guy. Great. Well, if you've got any more questions or comments or just congratulations for Ken, put them in the chat uh, and uh, we'll we'll get going to our next segment here. So um, a man who needs no introduction. Hi, everybody. It's an IPS update with me. Uh, so we'll we'll give you all the. <laughs> All the things you've ever wanted to know about IPS uh, and our goings on over the, the the last couple of months. It's been it's been a time. Let's just say that. Uh, throwing that out there, it's uh, it's been a year here for IPS and for the planetarium world. And um, while you know we've gotten through things quite well, we have a lot to be excited about in 2022 and beyond. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with IPS, uh, just a brief uh um sort of just refresher on how our governance system works and how ips is structured around the world um we have our president and then the elected officers uh the past president of course um was the president and the president elect before that the secretary and the treasurer we have of course our committees uh both standing and those that that kind of come and go as they're needed for uh, administration of the society and we have a director of operations uh, from a group called uh, Managing Matters that helps us to facilitate the uh, operation of IPS around the world. And then with these elected officers, we have nine board positions. And several years ago, uh, this board system was put in place to replace the old affiliate representation system where you know, groups like GLIPA and MAPS and GDP in in uh, in Europe and and you know regional organizations around the world would each have a representative, and that would be part of the IPS Council. 
And a few years ago, that governance changed to allow for a little bit more of a direct connection between the officers and the representatives of our members. And those are the board members that serve today. Uh, your officers, if you're not aware, uh, Karu Kimura from Japan is our president. She serves until the end of this year. Uh, our treasurer, Mike Smale, you may have heard of him. You might see him again a little bit later. Um, there's a president-elect, he's not important, let's talk about that later. Our past president, Mark Subarau, formerly of Aller and now of Goddard Space Center in Maryland. And then Patty Seaton, our executive secretary. Uh, these positions come up for election every two years. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the officers, of course, help to run IPS. They provide most of the leadership. And then the people that help to make our jobs a whole lot easier are the board members who are elected by the membership. And so in the United States, uh, in North America and in Europe and in Asia, there are enough IPS members where there are two board representatives. Uh, so in the United States and in Canada, you'd reach out to Dana Thompson from Ball State, Michelle Wistison, who's in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, Mila Varquez is our representative on the board from South and Central America. In Europe, uh, Bjorn Voss and Anna Green, again, someone you'll see a little bit later today. Uh, in Asia, it's Jin Zhu and Sumida Hirota. Uh, in Oceania, Martin George, former IPS president. And representing our members in Africa is uh, Susan Marabana Owen. And so these are your representatives in IPS most directly. And along with the officers, these elected officials make uh, the decisions and the policy for IPS. Now, since we are not holding a virtual meeting this year, we're not able to hold an in-person meeting. Of course, that was to be held in St. Petersburg, Russia. According to the IPS bylaws, it is required for us to hold a general meeting. This is an important thing. Uh, and just so that everybody knows, uh, for whatever reason, Mike Smale and I have a, uh, a long and ongoing thing to put as many gifts into IPS presentations as we possibly can. So you're gonna see some good ones today. The general meeting is bringing together all of the membership uh, to go through the business of IPS. It's where we you'll be introduced to a lot of our uh, uh, nominees and candidates for the, the positions that are up for election this year, as well as going over sort of all of the administrative work that IPS has had over the last two years. This will be a virtual general meeting this year, October 29th, holding it at 1200 universal time. Still a little early, but you can put it on your mental calendars and prepare for it. Uh, this is, of course, open to all IPS members, as you have the ability to uh, state your business and participate in the administration of IPS as a dues-paying member. So 2022 general meeting, October 29th. We hope to see you there. 2022 is also important because there are a lot of people and a lot of positions that are open for election and re-election. So for our board, we Daddy. have being it's spring break. So, you know, president elect first child of IPS, I guess. Uh, the 2022 board elections, there are five positions that are open for election. Um, as of right now, we have not confirmed that everyone will be running for re-election, but North America one is Dana Thompson's seat. Europe one is Bjorn Voss's seat, Asia one is Sumido's seat, and then Africa and Oceania are Susan and Martin seats as they are. If you are interested in running for the IPS board, you want more information of how this all works, uh, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Martin George, we'll put his information as head of the elections committee into the chat after the update. So that's the board, that's representing the members of IPS most directly. But then there's the really big positions and those are the elected officer positions. And we need you to get involved. Bernie is telling you right now, the future of IPS is at stake if you don't run for office. And so we want people who feel engaged and invested and inspired to help make the planetarium world better. And so this year, there are three positions open for election. President-elect, it is a six year term. And so you'll be elected this year service president-elect for 23 and 24, and then the presidential term is 25 and 26. There's the treasurer position and the executive secretary. And again, we will confirm soon uh, before the summer starts 
if our existing officers and board members will choose to run for re-election. In the case of the treasurer and the executive secretary, if you are newly elected, it is six years that you are eligible. The terms themselves, two years long. So again, contact me or you can contact Martin George for more information about what it is to be an officer. You might have heard a monkey, uh, but you also might have heard that next year, the planetarium world turns 100 years old and we're gonna have a little bit of a celebration. So starting in October of 2023 and running through May of 2025, it is our celebration of the centennial of the planetarium. For more information, planetarium100.org. Uh, but we're really excited to have Bjorn Voss uh, from Germany uh, and one of our European board members. He is the chair of the Centennial Committee. There will be a um, more information to follow, but there will be a Centennial kickoff event later this year that we hope all of you can get involved with. There's going to be all sorts of great things that we're really, really excited about uh, to, to share with everyone as we move into the Centennial. But next year, 100 years of planetariums very very exciting and in that centennial wouldn't you know there is a major ips conference we are hoping 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 uh that we are able to get everyone there and i don't know that there's not a war or a global pandemic again and that is in june of 2024 we're going to berlin and we're going to jena for um what will possibly be hopefully be the first in-person IPS conference in six years. Um, Anna Green from the Stiftung Planetarium Berlin, you've heard that name a lot today, of course. Uh, she is uh, our, our, our primary host for the Berlin uh, and Jena portions of this. It's united under the sky. Berlin, if you haven't been, fantastic city. We're really excited to be involved and to be able to be in Germany for the Centennial Planetarium Conference. Um, we cannot confirm nor deny that David Hasselhoff will be part of the festivities, but if I had my way as the presiding president, I would like to make that happen. It would be great. And if not, I will give the opening remarks at the Berlin conference in a light up leather jacket while the strains of looking for freedom plays in the background. So very, very excited for what Berlin holds in, uh, uh, in two years. We've got some upcoming events with our groups here uh, that are part of, uh, of IPS or, or groups that we have a very good relationship with. One of those, of course, is the Live Interactive Planetarium Symposium. Uh, LIPS 2022 is held this August at the Fisk Planetarium at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Very excited for this. Uh, and of course, it's LIPS, so it's live and it's in person. And I think Carrie and Kyle and me and Mark Webb and literally all of the LIPS revolutionaries, as we like to call ourselves, are very, very excited to get in person and be of everybody. We are blazing new paths in Colorado this August. So come with us. Let's light that place up uh, and have a great time in Colorado this August. You should join IPS. Uh, it's If you're not already, you should join. It's a great idea. Um, there are, of course, a lot of, of good things that you get from IPS. There's the quarterly journal. There's the participation in the conferences and, of course, the lower member rates that come with that. There's a lot of online resources and we're expanding our professional development offerings. But more importantly, being part of IPS means that you get a say and a role in the future of our planetarium community and making it better, not just for this generation, but for the future generations of planetariums to come. Our memberships start as little as 25 US dollars a year for students. There are institutional and corporate memberships that can cover multiple people. Tons of ways to get involved. You should do it. Go to ips-planetarium.org for more information and to sign up if you haven't already. And that's the IPS update. I'm done. If you've got any questions, put them in the chat. We want to keep things moving forward as we're, we're doing this. but. Uh, Really excited to have all of you participate in IPS. Would love to see uh, what the uh, the next group of nominees and candidates for the board and the officers are. Again, if you're interested, let me know. Really, really excited to have you. So there's that. Hey, IPS update. Look how good that went. Uh, and now we'll move on forward to the next segment. Uh, this is our update of the for the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program. Um, I think all three of you are still in the room. It's the greatest um, 
the greatest triumvirate, probably since Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. Uh, so one of the three of Shannon, Renee, and um, Tiffany, take it away. All right. Can everyone see? We good? Well done. I need I need to see someone's thumbs up. Okay, now I have now I have people with video. Cool. All right. So hi everybody. I am not Tiffany. Um, so I will be taking over for her today um, and talking a little bit about the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program, which I will not say again in full because it's too many words. So it is now ASEP for short. Um, so um, the applications are open for the next cohort for the 2022 cohort. So um, just thought we would introduce it to anybody who hasn't heard about it um, and may be interested in applying um, and just to let people know about the program a little bit more. Um, so the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program, uh, see, I said it again, um, is, or ASAP is, um, it's a program that takes nine astronomy educators down to Chile each year. Um, and this is in the broadest sense. So this includes amateur astronomers, planetarium and science center personnel, um, formal educators from any grade from, from uh, kindergarten through college level, um, um, anyone who, who educates the public in some way about astronomy um, and takes them down to the National Science Foundation funded observatories in Chile. Um, and they're considered ambassadors after this, um, who will then engage in outreach activities around uh, astronomy in Chile and why we build so many observatories in Chile um, and to better inform the US citizenry about why we spend so much money on observatories in, um, in, in Chile. Uh, and so in, you really do become a part of a, a global network or not a global, a, a huge network though in the US anyway, of um, of people who've been through through here. So the very first cohort went down in 2015, um, and that was the one that I was in along with Renee Kerrigan, Vivian White of the Astronomy Society of the Pacific. If you know her, um, she went down in our year as well as Sarah Devine, um, who we have seen on on these um, many times before. Um, among many, many others uh, that we have also see in at all of our conferences, like Josh Roberts and Derek Demeter. Um, so a lot of people that, that some of you may know or have seen present at other conferences. So, and that's just the planetarium folks. There's people all over um, the country who are part of, uh, of this, as well as Chilean ambassadors. Um, so really it does span the globe. Um, and so, this creates a network now of we have about 50 or 60 ambassadors that we can reach out to whenever we need support in a lot of different projects. Uh, and so I see everyone's lovely faces pretty frequently on all the various projects that I have gotten involved in with others, for, for instance. Um, and it really creates a very authentic opportunity um, uh, or an opportunity to be able to come back and talk authentically about the observatories in Chile and what it's really like to be there. Um, so these are some photos from the 2015 year. So again, you might recognize some of these lovely faces on here. There's Renee Kerrigan. There's Renee and Viv. There I am on crutches. Uh, Chilean health system is fantastic. If you break a bone there, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, but you get to see, go into the amazing observatories and see these beautiful mountains and all of that great stuff. Um, so why is this? I want to present. That's what I really want. Okay. Okay. Um, so some of the places that you would get to visit if you were to uh, be selected as an ambassador uh, would be going to some of the tourist observatories, one of which is Sierra Mayu, right outside of La Serena um, in Chile. So that's a really gorgeous place. That was the first place I saw the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, and I started hopping up and down very excitedly. Um, on one foot, because I was still on crutches then. Uh, so it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Some of the best skies that you would um, ever hope to see. 
Um, and for me personally, being someone from nor uh, the Northern Hemisphere to be in, with the sky that I was unfamiliar with brought back that magic of, of space and astronomy. But you know, when you're with, when you're with it every day, you can kind of start to lose a little bit. So it is uh, truly exciting. And Matt Dietrich is one of our ASAP ambassadors, and so this is one of his shots that he took um, as an astrophotographer down there. You also get to visit the Sarah Tololo Inter-American Observatory and behind folks there is the Victor M. Blanco telescope, which is the telescope um, observations were done at to prove that the universe was accelerating in its expansion. So really great historical scope and one of the very first um, uh, telescopes built on CTIO, of which there are like 30 different telescopes on that peak now. Uh, Gemini. Gemini South specifically, just this gives you a sense of how big this thing is. That's an eight meter mirror. It still, this doesn't do it justice. It's huge and it's cool. And you get to go see it and wear cool hard hats. Um, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array or ALMA, which is at uh, about 15,000 feet above sea level. Um, you have to wear oxygen when you go up. Our year, we just took oxygen canisters and we took hit of oxygen. And since then, people were have to take oxygen up with them in tanks because we uh, didn't do so well. But it is really fun and cool to go up to about uh, your the oxygen is about fifty percent of that at sea level for reference. So it is a really weird experience and really amazing. And it's really fun driving up the mountain and just seeing where like the vegetation just stops because you are so high. Um, in more recent years, this was not something uh, our year did, but other years uh, uh, would go to local schools and visit. Um, so this is Derek Pitts, who's of the um, planetarium at the um, Franklin Institute. That's uh, Cyan Proctor over here, who you might know as one of the members of the Inspiration4 mission, who just went to space earlier this year. Um, she was an ASA ambassador. Um, and so don't let that intimidate you in applying, though. Just to be clear, you see it more as a, that's cool. I could potentially hang out with Maya. Um, so who may uh, apply for ASAP? So the um, this is partially funded by the National Science Foundation, um, which has about five slots that um, NSF supports. And that's open to US citizens or permanent residents of the US. And that would be, again, amateur astronomers, any anyone who does science or astronomy communication, both formal and informal educators, planetarium uh, professionals, and so on. Um, but there's also five slots for people who are self-funded. So that might be someone who is paying their own way, or maybe it's from an institution or a grant, uh, another grant facility or a foundation where you get funding from. So if you have uh, funding you can provide for yourself one way or another, um, that is um, a slot that you can take and that's open to anybody. Um, and then also an educator from Chile has also been selected to go uh, with the more recent expeditions as well. Um, so, uh, there are some obligations for ambassadors. So uh, you do have to participate in conference calls to sort of get you prepped and ready to go, um, as well as afterwards, just to meet up with everybody. Um, you would participate in both pre and post evaluation activities. So there are external evaluators. This is an NSF funded project. Um, you travel to Chile for about a nine to 10 day expedition um, plus travel on either side of that. And so there are a lot of activities to participate in. Um, again, I broke my ankle there, uh, like very first day, going downstairs at the super fancy hotel the very first night before we even saw a mountain. And I still enjoyed myself and would do it again with two broken ankles because it is amazing. and. That is not the hard part at all, participating. Um, you then come back uh, home and you need to complete a minimum of seven outreach events around astronomy in Chile. Again, something very easy to do. Most of us in my year completed our uh, outreach activities within a few months and uh, we still do them seven years later. Uh, so we don't ever really stop. This is, this is a big part of um, what you can talk about authentically. Um, you do want to provide your own health insurance while traveling to Chile. 
um, and you, um, no matter which slot you get, NSF funded or self funded, you do need to pay your own way uh, for your flights to and from Santiago. Um, so within Chile, if you're flying, that's covered uh, if it's an NSF funded uh, one, but um, to and from Santiago is not. Um, for the self-supported, you have those flights to Santiago um, plus an additional $4,200 or so. Um, but once you complete your outreach events, you do get $500, uh, $500 stipend. Um, and I guess that was it. No, here we go. Applications are now open until May 31st. Uh, and you can go learn more information at the website astroambassadors.com to see who else has participated and learn more about the program. Um, but seriously, it's one of the best experiences of my life. Um, and it's given me this huge ASAP family that we can tap into for different projects. If you've heard uh, any of us talk about the big astronomy project and the show and the live events that we do, that was a project that came directly out of the ASAP program and conversations that Renee and I had when we were down there. Um, so it, again, you, you're getting tapped into such a huge network to make really great, amazing things happen. So I'll stop talking now. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, and, and got to tell everybody, you've got until May 31st. If you want to be part of this, it is one of the best programs really in the entire planetarium world. So would love because then if you go, you can come back next year and give a presentation about it at an e-conference. So it's just it's one big circle. Like, time is a circle. It's a construct. It's here. Perfect. Awesome. Well, with that, um, Shannon, I'll have you stop screen sharing. Hey, I'm doing that now. Okay, with that. Hey. So with that, we're on to our next part of the 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 e conference, and this one's a little bit more laid back because this is how you doing. So tell us, how are y'all doing? Just how's the last four months been for everybody? And hey, are you back at work completely? And if not, how is it being off today? So just turn it over to everybody while I deal with the seven-year-old. You guys go. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna start this by picking on someone. That person is Carissa Sador. Carissa, go ahead. Well, I didn't have a speech prepared. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Uh, the last four months have been nuts, um, but good, I think. Net good. Uh, I moved to Chicago and now I'm, I'm with the team at Adler and it's pretty cool. So uh, that's what's been going on with me. Uh, oh, also I'm working on a paint by numbers right now. Thank you. Um, it's very therapeutic. If you've never done it, I highly recommend it because you don't need any skill. It's great. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you, Carissa, for giving me the 45 <laughs> seconds I needed to, <laughs> to diffuse an explosion. Happy to provide, Michael. I, I would like to say that Carissa is fitting in perfectly here in Chicago. It's like she's a native already, um, and we're, we're really glad to have her. Oh, thanks, Mark. I did get annoyed at tourists yesterday, so I do feel like I am assimilating well. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as soon as you get run over by, uh, you know, one of those, uh, you know, wheelie things that the tourists ride in the summer, then you're going to be, you'll be solid. I would dare say that the way New York and Chicago are is the way that Philly and Pittsburgh are. So really, Carissa, you moved to the Pittsburgh of Illinois. Yes. It, it yeah. does feel like a bigger Pittsburgh, which is I would nice. agree with that. And, and that is a wonderful compliment, Michael. Thank you. So. <laughs> These are the sorts of insights you've been waiting five months on. So It's true. Well, Mark, now that you're unmuted, how are things going for you? Uh, things are, well, uh, things, are, things are kind of interesting. Um, I am actually... Uh, uh, was 
tested positive for COVID about a week ago. Um, I had what I think anecdotally may be the mildest case that I have heard of so far. I had symptoms for about five days and uh, today I have some congestion, but uh, nothing other to complain about. Um, and I'm getting ready to make an appointment for my second booster shot because the first three seem to have worked very well. So uh, I am kind of curious though, uh, can we have a brief show of had, how many have, have had uh, COVID over the past uh, few months? How many have tested positive? Yeah, I'm seeing some. Mostly not. I feel like uh, in my personal experience, if there are more people like that, it's pretty easy to miss it. I would have assumed that I had just a normal uh, congestion issue or flu or cold or something, except that my my wife was also positive and was definitely. Uh, you know, experience it. So. All right. Who else would like to share in this sharing circle time? Sean, go ahead. Sure. Well, Mark, I'll mention that my wife actually got COVID right after New Year's and she tested and I kept testing and she isolated in our master bedroom and I, isol I isolated in our guest room and I never got it. But for her, yeah. she just had a just had a mild sore throat and a fever one day, and she tested and she was positive and that was it. And the rest of, she was fine, but she you know had been vaxxed and boosted as well. So and I never got it. I kept testing you know at the university here yeah. and you know so I, for whatever reason. So I do think I, I highly think the vaccines and boosters are great. So yeah, I it was a full week before um, I tested positive uh, after exposure. So yeah. Yeah, I, I kept testing during the time she was isolating and then for about two weeks after and nothing. So who knows? But no, things have been busy here at, at our dome. We're getting ready for maps, of course. So that's the big uh, the big bit. We're, we're very excited to be having an in-person conference. And uh, we've got some fun things, of course, uh, planned, uh, including a little sec uh, secret announcement I'll mention to you guys. We have been able to secure funding for a very special main thing on the uh, Thursday night, which are Maine lobster rolls. Maine is known for lobsters. We will be having lobster rolls for one of our uh, events. Uh, and so that's gonna be uh, coming up. If you don't eat shellfish, well, it's kind of like, you know, if you come to my home state of Wisconsin and you don't eat cheese, I show you where the door, no, just kidding. But we'll, we'll have options. But it, uh, yeah, you'll really be missing something if you if you don't eat the, the main lobster rolls here, which are really incredible. Uh, but we'll be doing that Tuesday night uh, or Thursday, excuse me, Thursday night with our visit to the Challenger Learning Center uh, in Bangor. So we've got some things planned for that, along with the main mineral and gem museum and Mars stuff. So, Sean, point of clarification: mm -hmm. Are these warm lobster rolls or cold lobster rolls? They usually are served warm. Um, so yeah, usually served right warm. That's the right answer. Yep. Okay. And I believe they are the mayo, the mayo, there's a, like a, they're like a mayo based, but in a warm toasted roll in the whole nine yards. So this is exactly the information that all of you have been just dying to have <laughs> the last couple of months. So thank you, Sean, for delivering completely. Yeah. And of course there's going to be the trip to the main mineral and gem museum, which has the largest meteorite collection here in uh, actually, supposedly in, in the U.S., it's a private funded museum. They have the largest piece of Mars on planet Earth and uh, lunar meteorites, meteorites from Ceres, Vesta and others. So definitely something really cool as well. Um, and we're focusing on climate change and visual, visualization. We're going to have Mark Subarau here from NASA Goddard talking about some cool things. Carter's going to be doing some things with open space. Uh, lots of fun stuff planned. So, uh, yeah, hope you can join us. And uh, there's still opportunities to sign up, so. Patty, go ahead. I know I haven't talked nearly enough. It, it's like hurting me physically. <laughs> so, 
so many things, but um, yeah, I'm one of the few one planetariums that's still not open because of the school system. They've been really, our school district has been really, really very cautious. So we have been doing virtual things and starting to plan for next year because they're starting to open up for field trips, but we're still short on bus drivers. So we're trying to figure out how to maintain the benefits that we've learned with creating virtual programs and still getting some folks into the science center. My planetarium continues to be closed because Prince George's County is the most dysfunctional when trying to handle a planetarium renovation project. We literally closed the, the, the bids, or sorry, it wasn't bids, proposals in January, and we're still waiting to have a, a choice of selections. So for those of you who have bid, you're, it's not that you haven't heard, it's just we're very, 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 very slow. But that means that I personally will also be down for another year because we will gut and re I'll finally get a dream planetarium. I will have some form of a hybrid optical digital system and it will be fabulous. So I uh, wanted to share that so I can, I'm feeling Ken's excitement because I literally have been advocating for this for 12 years and I don't know how to market myself either. So it's been, um, it's been wonderful, but I'm also, because things are dysfunctional, I'm being very careful of how much I anger the people in charge because I don't want them to take away my money. <laughs> or I don't want to also piss them off because they have also said about, they would try to secure some money for upgrading the rest of the science center. And I have to remember that I'm part of a bigger, it's bigger than just me. So I have to very carefully consider what I say during this process. <laughs> So I love all of you that are part of the process. So you know that. So Steve, Mark, and Charlie, we're going to have your system no matter what. So, <laughs> so I'm excited about that. I finally get some co-lighting. <laughs> all right. Enough said. Hopefully someday I'll have an announcement for you. <laughs> so. All right, Colin, go ahead. Thank you. A uh, bit of an update from over here. Um, We've been stupidly busy uh, with full capacity where uh, all the schools seems to have woken up in January, decided to book us in February, mostly March. So I've been in the dome kind of pretty much all day on top of my normal day job. And it's about five, two, at least two or three, two 10 minute shows written in that time slotted between the, the gaps. So looking quite positive here in the UK. Uh, I'm hearing most people are being really busy as well, though. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, so we've, we've been pretty lucky with that one. I've been very lucky. I haven't been ill. I'm about the only person that think time is still standing. Um, I, th I think it's because I'm in my enclosed bubble that I can keep up everyone in a controlled manner. But uh, long may that continue. But uh, yeah, we're doing okay in the UK, though. Um, we've we had some bad news in from we the curious at the weekend who had a fire, so they've yeah, and the science museum the PV panels went on fire, uh, so they're currently closed for the next three at least three weeks. But the the community has got together and we're all offering as much help as we can. So uh, we'll we'll have a better idea of what's happening in the next few weeks. But uh, other than that, it's looking very positive here. Marco, go ahead. Well, thank you. I want to share with you a new project I have for my mobile planetarium. But uh, before that, I want to answer Lanika's question on the chat. She's asking about if small portable planetariums are back. Well, at least in our case, uh, yeah, we're back and people are very confident of getting inside a, a small dome. Uh, here in Costa Rica, probably because we have a very high vaccination rate, about 85% of the population already, and it shows in the numbers of infections. So we, we're doing quite good on that. So uh, I met a, a guy here at the beach because uh, for the last year I have been working half the time in our Central Valley and half the time at the beach, which you know, I don't complain, of course. And I found a guy uh, from California who uh, makes uh, music shows under the dome. And suddenly he he's learned that I had like the only dome <laughs> he could use in Central America. So we started planning about uh, what could we do together. Let me share you 
his website it's easier if you can just watch this so he has a show called sounds of the ocean he's a musician and uh, looking at his work well he plays live under the dome and it's something like this let me get you the pictures i found here i think this one's maybe so you see he's he plays and he has a dancer and everything i still don't know in which planetarium in california he was doing this but when we started thinking about what we could do with our mobile dome we found out that it's too small for him to get all his instruments and play live just inside there so we made an experiment and i um, made some recordings on film 360 video of him playing at the beach with his uh, clarinet and some instruments i already got that footage which, which i'm going to combine with his ocean views and dolphins and whale sounds and so we're making a like a hybrid hybrid product in which i have a show in our dome without him but somehow showing him and i'm not used to people relaxing and meditating inside our dome <laughs> it's totally the opposite but uh, this may get us into new uh, audiences. So we, we have like some, something like for meditating or, or something. It's an experiment, okay? And probably in, in the next months, I'll be able to, to tell you what, what happened about this. So this is going on in our mobile dome. Awesome. Thanks, Marco. Jay Heck, go ahead. Uh... I just wanted to say that uh, things have been looking up with a lot of our customers reopening and laser shows coming back. Um, we're excited to see that. Uh, recently, we changed up the uh, Buell Planetarium in Pittsburgh from a three projector system to a seven projector system. So that's got a big upgrade. And uh, we're about to uh, put a new system into Peoria. Um, so we're excited about that. And uh, just released uh, Laser Out and John. Um, so it's just nice that uh, um, things are, are starting to be on the upswing for us and for everybody it looks like, or you know, starting to. So it's, it's nice to see the turnaround. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. Anna, go ahead. Um, so our mobile dome intense has been, um, out for maintenance during the pandemic. So we haven't, we, we took it to our first two schools last uh, month for the first time since, uh, the end of 2019. Um, unfortunately, despite being the director of that, uh, I was not able to be there with it, uh, because I have, uh, been working from home slash on sick leave um, because of knee surgeries. Um, but also I'm very grateful to live somewhere with excellent health care and to work for an employer who supports me having these knee surgeries so that I can do my job better in the future. So um, February 28th, I had my first knee surgery. And at the end of March, the dome went out for the first time. So I didn't get to see it. I only got to see pictures, but from what I understand, everybody was super happy and we're, we're completely booked out for spring. Like we've, we've been trying to get teachers to book for the end of this year and the next school year, because we're already booked out. They've been, they've been asking the entire pandemic. So um, yeah. And it'll be longer until I get to go back out with it. Cause I just had my second knee surgery on Monday. So I'm on sick leave again right now. Um, and then I'll be in home office for a while yet too. So, um, and this is Lee Laps's ear. She's a great nurse. So she's hanging out with me. Uh, Anna, you are, you are a trooper. Um, yeah. This, this second knee surgery has not been nearly as painful as the first one. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the, in the first one, they did reconstructive surgery, but they also harvested some of the cartilage out of my knee. And then they grew more of my own cartilage in a laboratory and then in the second surgery, they put new cartilage of mine that they grew in a laboratory into my knee and it's growing me new cartilage to replace the damaged stuff. So I won't have arthritis anymore. And it is just like the coolest thing ever. Um, and super sciencey and just, it's amazing what medical science can do. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, but mainly the best part is that 
our domes back out again. So that means all of our domes, all four of our facilities in Berlin are open and up and running again. Awesome. Gary, go ahead. Thank you, Michael. Um, I can happily report that we are back showing star shows at the Asheville Museum of Science. For several years, I was using a Digitalis foam four meter dome and a star lab projector Sunday afternoons. Then the pandemic came along and despite my proposing some protocols, the museum decided that they had issues with uh, social distancing and airflow. So they've shut it down. Since then, I've been working with the Illuminati. Uh, we have a geodome portal, uh, a three meter one, and they have incorporated Stellarium into their open playground astronomy. And we're back running star shows on Sunday afternoons. Okay, good. Thanks, Gary. Charlie, go ahead. Ah, hello, everybody. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of great things going on lately. Um, purple for the first time, loving it, enjoying it. Um, I have, well, I mean, obviously, for those of you who know me, I'm always busy, <laughs> doing way too much. I have a, uh, you know, the day job with Siler, that's all going great. And there's going to be amazing things you'll hear about at uh, the conferences this year. And uh, same with Chroma Cove. And uh, things have been keeping us very busy with all that stuff. And, uh, and it's going well. All those concerns about chip shortages and things like that, that were really kicking our butts uh, uh, last year. Uh, we've we've adapted as best we can to get through that, to get systems out. And um, uh, we really like what's going on right now. So um, I'm very thankful for the people I work with and, and I partnered with there. Uh, but also like on completely a non-work related note, uh, I've been getting to spend some time out in the garage with my 67 Beetle uh, and it's fantastic. I can't wait to actually get that together and get it on the road and be driving that thing around. Uh, I will have to drive to some conference with it uh, when it's all done. But, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting to have, you know, actually have a hobby at some point. And yes, I will post some pics somewhere, Patty, so, uh, so I can involve everybody. I don't have it on this computer or a chair screen or something, but... Uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And the guy that I bought it from, uh, I don't know if I told you this story before, uh, his name is Charlie and he was actually an astronomer. So like there's this whole connection that I think helped uh, bump me to the head of the line of people that actually uh, were interested in the car. There are about 20 other people. So um, yeah, maybe one of these times I'll have a whole presentation on driving, dragging that thing back on a trailer and all the good vibes it was, it was providing. Um, and uh, I, I do have one picture that uh, I was joking with people about it being a, a German made star projector from the 60s because of all the holes, the pinholes in the, uh, the back behind the seat. Uh, when you shine a light, we're looking for all that stuff. It looked like a star projector. And of course, it's got a nice dome roof. So that works out too. But um, now it's been a lot of fun. It's like, whoa, what's a hobby? That's interesting. <laughs> all right. Thanks, y'all. Great seeing you, everybody. Charlie. Glenn, go ahead. Hey, hi, everybody. Sorry I was late. Uh, it's Friday night here, and there's some other stuff going on. I lost track of the time. Uh, just uh, Now and then we get to have some fun in the dome. And uh, next week I'm going to be in Greenwich at the Royal Observatory there. And uh, Brian May is releasing his album Another World in a, in a special event on Friday night. And uh, so he's got a couple videos and we've made a little full dome show to go with it. And then uh, he was actually driving me back to my hotel a couple weeks ago. And he said, do you know Grand Goldman from 10CC? I guess you all know the band. The older people here will know 10CC, the band. Well, he wrote a, a, a song called uh, Floating in Heaven about the James Webb, tel James Webb Telescope. Asked Brian to play guitar on it. And that's going to be premiered Friday night as well in the planetarium. And we got to do a little sequence showing the James Webb uh, telescope as a 3D model and looking here and there and playing the various visualizations that JPL and NASA have created up till now. We don't have any, of course, we don't have any real images from the, nothing impressive from the telescope yet. But uh, anyway, it's cool to be able to get to do stuff like that. And um, hopefully there'll be some 
it's going to be streamed, I think, live either on Instagram or YouTube, and it'll be certainly available to check out later if anybody's interested in stuff like that. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Anyone else want to share how they're doing right now? Or there'll be best parts later, but if if not, we got Patty, and that's important. It's now time for perhaps the, the favorite Hello. recurring segment of all time, the two years of e-conferences. Um, hobbled, but still here. Everyone, it is Anna Green and Long German Words of the Week. Yay. Woo. Woo. All right. So today I got your normal three and I have a bonus for you. So, Michael, if you could throw up the first one, please. Damn. I guess I have to recuse myself, right, Anna? Um, I mean, you you can play. <laughs> you're just a, you're a ringer, Glenn. John, it's all John good. Elbert plays, and he's, he's fluent in German, so why not? That's, that's right, okay. Uh, so the first one is the uh, Einverständniserklärung. The Einverständniserklärung is that the clearing up of a misunderstanding that has occurred between two people, often due to a language or cultural deficit, or is it the informed consent that can provide legal protection given almost always in at least written form? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> this one was a really interesting one, Anna. And Glenn's just being a klugscheiser. <laughs> Which is a smart ass. Powers so of deduction, got, I think, but it yeah. got us there. <laughs> all right. So we're about a minute in 26 years. <laughs> okay. So we've got about 80% of the, the precincts reporting. It's pretty overwhelming. Three quarters are stating that it is a clearing up of a misunderstanding due to language or cultural. Anna, what is the correct answer? Uh, I had to sign one of these when I uh, went to my pre-op appointment uh, saying that I understood that there are dangers that come with having surgery and being put under anesthesia. It is the informed consent that can provide legal protection. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, Germans really love having lots of signed forms. You can also see that 73%. Ah. It's just like right. when the Yankee kites be shiny going. Right, Anna, we're ready for word number two. Yep. And our next word is the Entspannungsfähigkeit. The Entspannungsfähigkeit. Is that the ability to the relax or is that the ability to fix the irreparable? Mm. So I'm just watching the votes come in and the lines are just yelling at each other. We're real close, it's about 50-50 here. 78% reporting. Oh, 80. Oh, somebody, somebody made a fool of me. Oh, wow, okay. 83%, it is 51-49, the ability to relax. Anna, is this, the ability to relax. Uh, my physical therapist has been working with me quite a bit on the Entspannungsfähigkeit of my muscles. <laughs> so it is the ability for my muscles to relax. I believe this is one of our first ever official 50-50s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The things. <laughs> And yes, thank you, Mike Smell. Consent is important. I got that a question later, but it is that's very important. Yes. Very important. All right. German word number three. Here we go. Right. This is the Aufenthaltsbescheinigung. The Aufenthaltsbescheinigung. Is this a certificate of recognition for a person who has held a position for a long time? Or is it a certificate of residence? Okay. 
This is definitely leaning towards one of the sides, about three, oh, 80% in, very good, 82, whoa. Oh, this one has inspired people that were not participating. Almost 90% participation, wow. Okay, let it open, keep it open for a few more seconds, just if people need to, to, to try it out. All right, so with 90% reporting, 80% of our respondents say it's a certificate of residence. Anna, what is the correct answer? It is indeed a certificate of residence. I received this when I was discharged from the hospital for me to provide to my employer saying that I had been hospitalized. It is different, however, from my Aufenthaltstitel, which is my residence permit. This is a residence certificate and Aufenthaltstitel is my residence title or residence permit, like an extended visa, which I get to renew later this year. Mine is called an Aufenthaltsgenehmigung. Yeah, you probably also have permanent residency though, so shush. I don't want to hear about that. it. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to go to the you don't have to go to the Auslander Bahoda. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I put my I put my time in, believe me. <laughs> I know. With the last name beginning with S, you can imagine how long I had to wait in lines in <laughs> Germany. <laughs> it's the longest line at the uh, at the Auslander Amt. Berlin, yeah. Munich, the ultimate fight here at the e-conference today. <laughs> all right. All and right, then, so of course, I have a bonus word for you all. So good. And this is a word you saw in 2020. Oh. But I want to see if you remember. <laughs> here we go. Long word of the week. Number four. Die Arbeits- und Fähigkeitsbescheinigung. The Arbeitsunfähigkeitsbescheinigung. She's making Is this, this a up. worker's right to fair and equal treatment? Or is this a certificate of incapacity to work? Oh, I totally remember this one. That's great, Carissa. <laughs> That's a cat walking across the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Just be aware, we've had, I think, 40 e-conference events over the last two years. There's been a lot of stuff that we've talked about. Yeah. Like you, you might remember when Carissa had us walk around Animal Crossing. So, and we all smacked her with how could we forget? Pets. Could not forget that. That's oh. that's got strong early twenty twenty uh, energy to it. <sighs> all right, so thirty eight of forty one people have participated. We're so close. Ninety two percent in. Seventy five percent of people says it is a certificate of incapacity to work. Anna. What is the correct answer? I'm very proud of you all because you did not get that right last time. You got it right this time. Jade. It is a certificate of incapacity to work. And I'm very grateful that my phone has learned how to autofill that word because <laughs> like I can rattle it off now with no problem. I can say it with no problem. I know how to spell it, but oh my gosh, when I'm writing it, it just looks like the biggest jumble of nonsense gobbledygook words I have ever seen. And like, there's plenty of times I'm speaking English and I think German words make more sense to fill into the sentence, except nobody would understand me, but that's beside the point. Like this one word, it's just like, let's just throw all these random letters in there. Patty, However, I got a check in on you. <laughs> How many did we get, Patty? One out of four. Okay. Yeah, yeah, one. Okay. Just remember, you've got two years until Berlin, so... Anna will continue and to. Could we do useful German phrases of the week? I've next offered time? that. Hey. I have offered that. I have offered that, and um, have not been taken up on it yet. So I would be happy to do <laughs> useful German phrases Ooh, of. The we week. can go back and forth. Anna, you can do a week, and then Glenn will bring you in for a session, and then we'll go back and forth, and then by the end of it, you will all be able to say the fifteen most important things you need for IPS twenty twenty four. Um, and Amy, yes, you did get the theme. They were all things that were related to my surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> the only way because... I got the last two was through uh, context clues. So yeah, that helped me guess yes. the whole time. <laughs> yep, and you know what? That's um, that's totally fine. I like I said, I haven't had a heck of a lot going on, so I took from what I could <laughs> and what I had lying around, like physical therapy brochures. <laughs> but you did make good plausible alternatives yes Thank you and it's, it's one of those really things the key too of long german words yeah well and it's one of those things too where 
sometimes there may actually be a long German word for the fake answer, or you could potentially just make one up. But yeah. Anyway, how, how is um, how is um, uh, dialect up there in slang? Uh, depends. I, I'm on in Bavaria, I guess, and I don't know if anybody's got as much dialect as the Bavarians, but. Uh, um. Well. Um, to, oh, wait a minute. The, the, the uh, the, I don't, I'm trying to think of how to say this delicately. Um, everybody <laughs> I know who's not from Bavaria, which is most of the Germans I know, will tell you that they can't understand what Bavarians are saying. And um, I am inclined to agree. And it made me feel better that native Germans can't understand Bavarians either. And it's not just me. I can um, understand them, but I can't speak back. Well, and the Berliner dialect can be quite harsh, but most of them speak high German. Um, you will you will hear um, when a couple of Berliners get together, though, they'll really start. And I have a couple coworkers who definitely speak with the Berliner mm -hmm. dialect. And it's taken me a while to be able to to converse with them more easily. Um, but you get there. Um, and it, it's it's the the Kennedy sounding minus the Americanness of it. So it's that really hard like Ica. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and dit instead of das and ich denke dit das. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very like percussion y yeah, versus yeah. in the South, it's more of a shh sound. So, like, I know the in variants are really in, amazing in, too. In yeah. Berlin, in Berlin, you get the ich or icke. High German is ich. And in Southern Germany, you have ish. And all of those mean I. And then you or go to Austria. E, and it's or just E. I was net. Ich bin, ich war das nicht. I was net. Yeah. So. I think what we're saying is we're coming back to the German well a lot in the next couple of years. So Hey, we got yeah. Oktoberfest again finally in September. You're all invited. Ooh. Hey, I might be able to walk by then. <laughs> we have a table on the first day. I got 10 places. bringing people together here. Yeah. So Anna and, and Glenn, thank you for keeping us cultured. And speaking of cultured, it's time to go to the Windy City. Let's do the record shop with Mike Smale. Hey, thanks, Michael. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the record shop. Uh, if you've been here or not before, basically, we're going to take a look at uh, three records, things that uh, I enjoy, things that are kind of space related, and then we'll share information about uh, how you can track them down if it sounds like the kind of thing uh, you might be interested in. So to start us off today, uh, first out of three, this is actually, um, I was looking back, this is uh, kind of a new thing. This is the first time that I've shown one of these records on, uh, on the segment, and that is a 10 inch record which is uh, kind of an in-between, kind of an EP length uh, size. Uh, it's, not, it's not a seven inch, it's not a single, it's not a full 12 inch LP, but nice in between. And what we have here is uh, actually the only release by My God, It's Full of Stars. It's called M29. Uh, before we go any further, uh, any astronomy experts in the house without cheating actually know what M29 is? I'm going to guess that it's a deep sky object. <laughs> open uh, so in it, it is a, I'll give you an open cluster in Cygnus. That's uh, Mr. Eric Shore coming through with the correct answer. Yes, it is an open cluster in Cygnus. Uh, it is fairly close to uh, the star Seder, which uh, if you like me have never pointed out the star Seder in a sky show, it's right at the intersection of Cygnus. It's right where the wings and the body meet. Um, so the, uh, the album is not particularly, um, you know, it's, it's not about the cluster of stars and sickness, but that's just the, uh, the name they used. Uh, and there is an awful lot of, uh, space type content in the, uh, in the album artwork. The, uh, the inner sleeve is a nice, uh, nice little star map. And then, uh, the record itself, pretty cool looking. Also the first time I have showed a glitter filled record on the record shop. So this is a uh, clear vinyl with go. gold glitter embedded in it. Uh, this wow. is limited to 150 copies on Spartan records out of Washington. 
And the uh, the project itself, My God is Full of Stars, is the side project of a guy named uh, Rob Schweitzer, who, uh, no relation to Jim as far as I know, but used to play keyboards in a band called May. Uh, he broke off, started this own side project, which is basically a very sort of synth heavy, uh, it's kind of a synth pop, synth rock uh, type music. The uh, the 10 inch itself, so they're they're smaller than a, like I said, smaller than a full LP, so they can't hold as much music. They can hold uh, 12, maybe 15 minutes of music on the side. Uh, so this is just a little six song a little six song EP, uh, but it is still available. And actually, um, so the, I'm gonna put the info in the chat here. The uh, the record itself, though, it was an edition of 500. There were a couple different colorways. Uh, the actual record itself is available for Spartan. It's actually on sale right now for only 10 bucks. Uh, so kind of a uh, kind of a cool little pickup. And then there's also the band camp link there. So you can, if you wanna listen to it first, get a feel for, get a feel for what it's all about. Uh, before deciding to uh, pull the trigger on it. And it's, it's pretty cool because like, um, so the, the glitter can cause some surface noise with, uh, you know, you think, if you think about it, you're, you're literally, there's, you know, there's, there's glitter in between the, uh, in between the PVC and between the plastic here. So it's, it's going to add some unevenness there. They are a little more prone to surface noise, but uh, honestly, it still, still sounds pretty good. So that is our, First go. Uh, jumping back to the chat, Mark Webb, I am not in your old office. Oh, okay. Uh, I am in an office in the astronomy wing that is currently vacant slash will be used for virtual field trips and uh, drop-in meetings uh, as needed. So, um, all right. Next up, we have uh, the self-titled release by the Swedish uh, post-rock quintet Planetariat. Uh, Planetariat is the Swedish word for planetarian, so that's fun. Uh, their second release was called uh, Rimden, Rimden, which is the Swedish word for space. So more uh, more connections there. Uh, this is another EP. This is only this is a this is not a twelve inch, but it's only it's only three tracks. Uh, you can see appropriate you know space theme there. Kepler, Juno, and Sirius. The names of the uh, the names of the songs. So this is post rock. So this is guitar, bass, drums, uh, lots of lots of swelling, lots of tension, lots of back and forth flow in the music. And then the uh, the record itself is a nice uh, split colorway. It's uh, half black, half white. And then again, the uh, it is a uh, two tracks on one side, uh, one track on the third side. So the, they they are a little bit longer. So this uh, the track series here that's on the back side is actually pushing uh, 13, 14 minutes all by itself. This was a uh, released on a. Uh, call it a label, uh, a thing called Feed Bands, which was kind of like a vinyl subscription service. Uh, it's not around anymore. There were there were 800 copies uh, of this EP pressed. Uh, so if you are interested in tracking this down, you're going to have to go to like Discogs or, or eBay or some sort of secondary source to find it because it's not uh, not easily available in print uh, right now. Sadly, it does not come with with black and white cookies, but uh, sounds. I would argue it sounds better than black and white cookie tastes. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Oreos are pretty tasty. Oreos are, are much better than this. Like I'm, I'm talking about the black and white, like frost cookies. Uh, I mean, they're okay, but yeah, Oreos way better. All right. Last but not least, uh, third record for today is actually one of my newer, uh, newer pickups. I grabbed this just about a week ago. Uh, it is called Stations. It is by Fieldworks. Fieldworks is the the project name. Uh, there's a guy uh, based out of Indianapolis now. He's an artist. His name's Stuart Hyatt. Uh, I actually used to work with Stu at a science museum in Columbus, Ohio, and he now does uh, I describe his auditory artwork. So Stations was a collaboration with uh, the Anchorage Museum uh, for an exhibit they had there, and what they did was they partnered with something called the Earth Scope Experiment. So the Earth Scope experiment, you can actually see some, uh, some of the detectors here in these pictures. These were seismic monitoring devices placed uh, all around the United States, mostly in the Western US, if I remember correctly. Uh, and they were basically detecting uh, seismolo seismographic information, detecting you know, what's going on inside the Earth and recording some sounds of the Earth. And this uh, compilation is kind of an attempt to put a wrapper on what the earth sounds like. And the, the album itself is not just, you know, 
it's not just earth sounds. There's some light instrumentation, some light sort of choral vocals laid over top, over top of it to make it a little bit more listenable, a little bit more palatable. And the nice thing here is that um, if you do grab the vinyl version of this, not only do you get uh, the full LP, the, uh, the 10 tracks, you also get bonus remixes by a variety of artists sort of known in the uh, ambient electronic uh, modern classical fields. I'm not sure how readable that is. It looks like it's maybe just a little bit soft. Uh, ben Chatwin, uh, one there. I think I've talked, I think I've featured um, some Talioris records in the past. That's Ben Chatwin's, uh, one of his musical nom de plumes. But yeah, nice, uh, nice chill out. Again, it, and it, I think it, the, at first I was kind of when, so he's done some, some of his other releases before. He's actually done, uh, so he's done 10 of these albums altogether. Some of the previous ones used vocals and I found it a little, a little off-putting, but in this one, it, it works nicely. And it's kind of a, like, you know, what, what could the earth sound like and kind of what could it be like to sing along uh, with the earth? The, uh, the vinyl itself, just on, uh, just on black vinyl. Uh, this is on Temporary Residence, who sometimes does, I featured a couple of Temporary Residence records in the past. Sometimes they include, uh, they'll do maybe like a limited color, like 500 copies on colored vinyl, and then, you know, a couple thousand on black, something like that. Uh, but in this case, uh, it feels like, I think it's just uh, the only pressing is the, the solid block pressing. Uh, and if any of you happen to be going to Anchorage, Alaska between now and September, the, uh, the exhibition that Stations was sort of created as a part of, uh, alongside, uh, will be on display at the Anchorage Museum until this September. All right, uh, last but not least, now I'm gonna try and do the thing that I always forget how to do, which is sharing the quick hit of all the stuff that you really, uh, that you really need to know about. Again, the, uh, the links, the releases for, for all three of these, uh, the two EPs, M29 and Planetariat, and then uh, the full length uh, stations release and where you can hunt down all of those. Uh, and Stu is actually really cool. Like I, I, he's working with him was fantastic. And I used to play softball with him. Was in a band with him. He's just a really cool dude. And does a lot of um, all the audio he does. It's all it's all field recordings. So it's like not sounds produced in a recording studio, but it's uh, you know natural sounds. Maybe you know things you might hear in a forest, or even you know human constructed. You know the sound of the train going by your window. So it's all uh, all of his works are field recordings of various uh, of various types. Uh, very cool things to dig into. All right, so that's what I've got for today. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I'll uh, check the chat for any questions. Mike, as always, thank you so very much. And then as we have you know, closed out our e-conferences the last few times, um, just all the respect to Renee Kerrigan for bringing this idea up to us at the, the, the beginning here of, of sort of ending on a really good note, the best part, uh, whether it's your day, your week, your month, your quarter, um, even your year, this is the, uh, the time to, to be able to share it. And of course, it doesn't have to be professional. If it is, great. Um, but if there's just great personal things that, that you want to share, just ends on the best of notes for us in our e-conference. So, Renee, as always, you have um, you have first best part if you have, if you'd like, and then everyone just feel free to uh, to chime in as you see fit. Uh, thank you, Michael. I have to go open the door for a planetarium show in one minute, um, but uh, I will say that my best part of today so far was that um, my my daughter Stella is on her on a break from school today. So my husband and my two daughters came to the museum uh, to see me and they saw my moon exhibit that's on display right now, as well as some of the art um, art exhibits that we have up. And uh, they also watched One World, One Sky in the planetarium and I had an audience in here that wasn't just like I turned it on for them, which I sometimes do. Just be funny because Rosemary kept trying to come to me as I was doing the beginning announcements. Um, but when, Elmo came on uh, during One World, One Sky. Rosemary like literally started to dance and um, giggle and laugh. So uh, it was a nice reminder to me that I have seen that show 152 million times because I've been running it, I think for 11 years, um, but it's a wonderful show. And it's, it was nice to see it uh, through the eyes of my two-year-old. So that was my best. And now I have to go. If anybody, if anybody else would like to run that show 152 million times, give me a call. We can talk. 
That was that was smooth, Mike. I got to give that to you. Robin and Adam, go ahead. Okay. Um, can you hear me? All right. Yep. This is this is something that uh, occurred about two months ago. My brother was looking into um, basically a way of helping him and his um, sore muscles and stuff. Uh, because of cold. And so he was looking into something that were that is a heated vest. I don't know if you have heard of these things. So think of Star Trek, and they would hit their little communicator and set your temperature at so and so. Well, guess what? It's real. And so I, I had I actually ended up getting one myself. But to show you, I also got like the components that make it work. So if you've not heard about these things, you need to look into them. I do not own any stock in any of this stuff. I love it because I get cold and you're outside and you're observing, you freeze your, you know what? This stuff works. So what is it? Okay, it uses carbon fiber heating pads. Think about that for a second, carbon fiber, it is actual fabric, carbon fiber fabric, that if you apply electricity through it, it will uh, emit in the uh, low infrared. And that means heat. Here, it, I don't know if you can see. So I have, this is actually a pack of five of these that are all connected by wires. And so you can see one of these pads. Now, it's not the this is not the pad itself. This is just a like a felt covering to it. But in between the two layers is a very thin strip of the carbon fiber material with two uh, connection points. You can see all the wires. It has a control button, which I will use. I'll show you in a second. It is powered by USB. So you get one of these that are very inexpensive. It runs on five volts. Oops, oh, you gotta hold it. There you go. Runs on five volts, but the key, here it is, 2.4 amps. If this does, if it's one of those that does 2.1 or one and a half amp, ain't gonna work. Use 2.4 amps. You have high, medium, low. And, or off, of course. And this one is this little kit, not the battery, but the pads and the wires and the controlling circuit was like $15. You can sew these in or attach these inside your favorite coat or vest or shirt or whatever. Um, these I'm actually using inside for my pants because I have the vest and I have longer ones that are similar to this. There's two of them that are for boots for shoes so you put them under your feet and you you are in uh warm coziness heaven i'll tell you that right now so um this is a 10,000 milliamp hour battery usb battery source that will probably last these at least three and a half four hours at high setting and then as you go low then the the uh length is longer just look on Amazon as an example, not that you have to buy from there, and look for carbon fiber heating pads, and you're gonna see everything, you name it. They've got stadium seats with this stuff, they've got coats, uh, they have gloves and all that. We're gonna buy the gloves this next season, uh, but they work, it's feeling really warm, and uh, when it makes direct contact with your skin, you really feel the warmth, if it's just loose, then you have just a general warmth, but it really helps. So I'm going to turn it off. You just press and hold it. But you want you want the circuitry, or you if you want to buy the vest already made with it sewn in, you can do that too. But anyway, I wanted to share about these, and they're great. And uh, somebody to, has been very very happy. Oh with yeah, all the heating. Yes, because <laughs> I get cold very easily. And it really has helped. And if you're doing observing sessions or something, I mean, okay, Michael's, well, I, you're not in Florida anymore. 
So it, it gets cold enough uh, up here to actually need some warmth. Yeah. And so when you're sitting still and it's 20 out or less and you're just and you're out there for three hours. Yeah, it gets cold pretty fast, especially with your feet. So look them up. They're they're great. Very cool. Any other best parts? Kyle, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I actually use those batteries. Uh, what I I went to uh not the heater but those batteries for my cameras when i went to egypt i got to travel again Woohoo! Um, those of you who know me realize that my soul starts to shrivel if i if i sit in one place too long uh this image here i took at the uh beginning of our trip at the white desert in uh in egypt and this is actually uh an image that i took uh lit by the full moon which is very cool so I started out uh, with the full moon. I ended the trip at the new moon, which was the beginning of Ramadan. And I was able to spend a couple of days with a uh, dear family that I know there in Giza. Uh, it, it, it was amazing. Uh, I, I, I could, well, stumbling over words here. Uh, it was wonderful to be able to get out and uh, feel a connection with the rest of the world again. Um, can't tell you how 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 much good that did for my soul uh yeah so that was my best part so far awesome awesome anybody else colin go ahead yes uh well just the other day my brother came unexpectedly came to visit and so for the first time in about five years he actually saw me i think probably the first time he's seen me present a show uh full audience and it was one of those dream audiences that were just lapping it up uh, but i've also had confirmed coming up uh, an opera has been written for me by students of the royal conservatory in birmingham uh, in may and i've also got another gig coming up in june again with conservatory so i'm getting a lot of music written for me for free uh, some of some of which has been allowed to make available for other people um but i'll try keep working on it and you might who knows you might even get a planetarium show out of it as well very cool all right any other best parts mine is right behind me oh it's the gazebo and hey now i have always that yep this is what i've always wanted and now it is in my backyard so <laughs> It's making me very happy. I actually bought it last fall and it didn't get installed until just in time for spring break. So guess where I've been spending my spring break. Yeah. You need a planetarium projector for that, Patty? Hey, you can put a dome in there too. You know, a long time ago, my neighbor gave me, she found some design for a gazebo that served, doubled as an observatory. So I didn't quite go that far, the gazebo. <laughs> Anyway, that's my best part of this week. Very cool. All right, let's head to the City of the Arts, beautiful Costa Mesa, California. Scott, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, back uh, last month, we were able to uh, finally reopen the planetarium. Uh, we had this uh, big reopening event. Some 1,600 people showed up, which was about four times as many as we uh, wanted. Uh, but that was it was great you know, to, to blow the doors off and uh, I was able to put together our first uh, kind of major exhibit in the uh, the lobby got some uh, a bunch of meteorite samples it took you know a, a whole week's worth of staying until you know 11 o'clock midnight to you know run cables under the floor and put everything in place but uh, it all came together and I'm very uh, very pleased with how it uh, turned out so I'm we're back in business and I'm excited Ooh. Fantastic. Susan, I see your hand. Go ahead. Well, my son started a project. He ha He's a contractor. He's got his own, own uh, team of guys that have been uh, coming over every single day. They're building an extension on my kitchen and, and a covered gazebo or sort of, you know, trellis kind of thing on my back porch. And I get to see him every Monday Monday through Friday, every day. <laughs> so I'm super happy. And I mentioned to him, uh, I had this extra small garage on, on my house. 
that uh, wouldn't it be fun to put a planetarium in there? <laughs> and so I'm, I've got him thinking about it. <laughs> right. Any other best parts before we wrap up today? This would probably be the best part of my day. This was, God, it feels good to be back, guys. Feels good. I don't know. We'll do it next week. No, that's not going to happen. But at the very least, well, Mike, you tell me how long you need to get some new records and then we move on. <laughs> I mean, I've got probably like 1,400 I haven't talked about yet, but, you know. <laughs> it, it, we're going to have e-conferences at some point that are just segments. And then it's just a variety hour of comedy. And then, Scott, you can come in and do stand up for us. <laughs> the Paul Frank five minutes, you know. Somebody Mike, are all your records astronomy themed? No, no, it's, I've <laughs> got maybe another 10 or 20 to dip into that are astronomy themed. But I also do, this is there, you know, sometimes I'll throw in other ones that aren't, aren't explicitly related to that's just, you know, things I like or things I think most people should hear. Oh, cool. I got about 100 astronomy themed wine bottles. That's interesting to anybody. <laughs> Tour of Glenn's wine cellar. That's, that's would be one of our one of our future hospitality suites. Is drink your way across the universe. There you go. Could be a lot of fun. I'll be there. All right. Well, I think at that point it is. I mean, not typical. We're eight minutes over, but you know, it is what it is. Um, thank you all so very much for having a really good time on a Friday morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you might be. But it has been always a great time with all of you take care let's do it again at some point maybe not in five months but hey and if you're going to be at maps let's let's give sean the best time possible i i, I think that'll we'll be, be there. it'll be real good we'll be there so until next time everyone take care we'll see you again real soon also join 